Okay, so I will to talk today about uh, combining superpowers, right? We have these two superheroes here. The one is the NPC hero, the other one is the confidential computing hero. Can we make them work together in an efficient way so that we can leverage the benefits of both and create something even more powerful? So I skipped the next slide because Paul basically said everything already that is on that slide. Ah, one thing is missing, so this is joint work with some of my colleagues from Bosch Research, so Jonas Eppard, Vincent Rieder and Christoph Bösch. Um, two or three sentences about Bosch because maybe nobody, uh, 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 not everybody knows about uh, Bosch in detail, so we are really a huge company, over 400,000 employees all over the world, 470 uh, subsidiaries uh, located in more than 60 countries. Uh, we are active in various spaces, not only refrigerators and appliances, uh, mobility solutions is our strongest um, division, uh, but also industrial uh, technology, energy building uh, and consumer goods. Uh, so I personally, I work in Bosch Research. We look into as the name implies, research and pre-development. Uh, I'm uh, one happy guy among uh, a crowd of 1,800 people working in all these different areas. So, of course, it, that's not everything IT. Uh, we are distributed around the globe, uh, nine different uh, research facilities, uh, everybody over the world. Um, we look into 12 different strategic portfolios, and one of uh, these portfolios is information and communication technology, and that's why I'm talking here today. We have a lot of PhD students, so if you know anybody who is interested in the topic, uh, please uh, tell them to reach out. We are always open to uh, host these bright guys uh, in our company. So we will talk about confidential computing, which I presume you know uh, very well, uh, maybe even better than me, or probably better than me. So I will not focus on that. I will give a quick introduction to secure multi-party computation so that you understand what I'm talking about in the, in the, in the follow-up slides then. So uh, what is uh, secure multi-party computation? So in the first place, it's a collaboration enabling technology. So what it allows you, two or more parties to uh, using cryptographic protocols to compute uh, on a, a data set that consists of data sets coming from different people without actually bringing it uh, together in one place. So that's the, that's the whole idea of MPC. Um, what we do with Carbine Stack, so Paul mentioned it quickly, uh, so we try to make this enterprise great, right? So there are a lot of startups in that space, but we think the better approach is doing it in an open uh, uh, context as an open source project in open collaboration. Uh, the basic idea is to combine the uh, the, the cryptographic protocols, uh, state-of-the-art ones, and combine them with cloud-native technology to create something that has all the nice uh, capabilities of uh, cloud-native solution, scalability, elasticity, reliability, and so on and so forth, you name it. Uh, we also look into research aspects, so that's the small Gantt chart at the, at the bottom left. Um, as of today, there are still a couple of open questions, so what is, I, th I think, uh, Un undisputed is that it's a very secure technology because it roots in math, right? It's, you can prove the protocols. Uh, of course, you have to do a good job in implementing it, but uh, from that basis, it's uh, the best you can get. Um, but there are still some problems regarding cost efficiency. So th these technologies, typically depending on the use case, have very significant overheads. So we talk about order of magnitudes, not single digit percentages like uh, for confidential computing. Uh, they also have a maturity problem still. So there are solutions out there that can be adopted, but it still requires a lot of effort to bring uh, your existing solutions on top of that. And then finally, usability is also something that is related to that. And what we want to achieve with our research uh, uh, work is to close these gaps to make it uh, in, the, in maybe a little bit more far future, as usable as confidential is as of today. So a quick intro into uh, secure multi-party computation. So we will talk about three things. The first is I.O., the second one is doing additions, the third one is multiplication. These are the three things that you need and then based on that you can build uh, whatever you can do with, uh, with a regular uh, uh, computer as well. So the, what we do here is uh, called ad additive, additive secret sharing. So you see these uh, three secrets on the right, these uh, red 
uh, circles. These are the secrets that you have, right? So one player has a seven, the other one has a, a four, and the last one has a nine. And what you do now is called secret sharing. So you split up that secret into three numbers in that case, uh, because we have three players. So the seven is split up into one, two, four, and the sum of it is, of course, seven. You do the same for the others. And then you do secret sharing. That is distributing one of these secret shares so one of these numbers, in the case of seven, player one, the, the one is he keeps for himself, the two he sends to player two, the four he sends to player three, right? And that uh, every party does that. And, and then we have uh, the, the input phase is, is, is done. Uh, what you can do now is you can do addition. Uh, simply by the fact that uh, addition is uh, commutative, you can uh, just do the computation, the addition locally, which is the step from the the second blue row uh, to the first uh, green row. Uh, so you add one, zero, and two. This gives you a three, and so on for the others as well. And then you again, uh, do, now you want to do the output. So uh, distribute the result of the addition, and then you distribute your number that you have calculated locally on the secret shares from everybody to the other parties. Then you can do the sum again, and uh, what you can see is now 20 is exactly the result of adding seven, four, and nine at the top, right? So that is how addition works. Uh, that is super simple. Uh, uh, it's it's also a little bit simplified because we usually, uh, at least in Carbine Stack, we uh, work in the active security model. That means you have to make sure that people cannot cheat. And that adds a little bit more of uh, involved protocols here, but, but that's the, the basic approach, right? Now we come to multiplication. We will not go through everything because that's a little bit more complex. But the key takeaway is that modern MPC protocols are built in a way where you have two independent phases. The first one is the offline phase, the other one is the online phase. In the offline phase, you use kind of heavy cryptographic protocols like oblivious transfer, homomorphic encryption, and others uh, to create so-called correlated randomness. So what does that mean? So randomness, it's clear. So it's, these are random numbers. Uh, and in the case for multiplication, we have three of these numbers for every multiplication that you want to do in the distributed setting. And it's called correlated because there is a correlation between these random numbers that you generate. So we have eight B and C, and the correlation is that A times B is C. And now these numbers are generated in a way that every party possesses only, as before for the addition um, uh, example, the secret shares and not the numbers itself. Yeah? And then you can use, I will not go through it as I said because it's a little bit involved, so you can use these numbers to do multiplications uh, also in a similar way as you do the additions without only using local operations after some network operation. Right? The, the thing that you have to take away here is that um, this is done in an offline phase and it includes very expensive cryptographic operations in terms of com compute complexity and uh, communication. So what, what do, do we do with that now? So what we do, we build uh, what we call an always encrypted collaboration substrate. That's a bit marketing, blah, blah, but anyway. Um, so we build a platform where the, the, the data that uh, parties put in is actually kept encrypted all the time. Uh, in the difference between uh, MPC and uh, confidential computing is, is here that it's really kept encrypted all the time, even when it's processed, right? So for, for confidential computing, as soon as it leaves memory, it gets decrypted, then it's processed in the clear text, and then when right back to memory, it's uh, encrypted again. This is not a case here. It stays encrypted all the time. So it's a multi-step process. So first of all, the parties that want to engage in a joint community, they f uh, computation, they form a, um, a cluster of, of parties. So these are the, f the four offices that you see there. And then they engage in a binding process to each other where some secret keys are generated that are used later on for ensuring that people cannot cheat. Uh, then they, um, the parties uh, submit their inputs uh, um, in a way, as described before, so that no, nobody else knows the secrets of, of uh, one party. Uh, and then they can define also who has access to what, to the input data, to the output data, to intermediate results that can be set up using a policy and then uh, the computation is, is performed, and finally they can, using this op output operation that we saw in the addition slide, they can pull together the secret shares again to finally get, get the, the, the result of the computation. 
So what can you do with that? I think there is a very big overlap between what can be done with confidential computing and what can be done with secure multi-party computation. So you can do this virtual data pooling. So bring together data from many, many uh, organizations or parties uh, without actually exposing that data to the others and still be able to do analytics on top of it uh, and, and so on. Secrets management, that's uh, I, I think as of today the most successful branch where MPC is used. So you see all these uh, uh, software wallets, uh, many of them use uh, secure multi-party computation to secure the secret keys and that's exactly what you can do with it. You can create kind of a virtual HSM that uses secure multi-party computation to split the, the keys into secret shares and then distribute it, which means you have to att successfully attack uh, all of the places where these secret shares are located to actually recover the key um, and also to uh, invalidate the security of operations done with that, with that secret key. Uh, private co correlation, so that's uh, also an interesting uh, um, technique that can be built on top of MPC. So let's assume Paul has a list of people he talks to about confidential computing. I have one talking about MPC. We want to know the intersection between, between these two sets without exposing our lists to each other, right? And that's what you can do with that, with cryptographic guarantees again, right? And the last thing is collaborative learning. That's, um, yeah, federated learning. Let's, that's maybe a different term that you can use for it. And you can, for certain parts of the federated learning process, not the training itself, but for doing the aggregation, then in the back end, you can use secure multi-party computation uh, to do that with, with these cryptograph cryptographic guarantees. Okay, so, I hope that gives you at least a high level idea of M what MPC is and now the question is, so I announced uh, this talk as Pets of the World Unite, so what do we want to unite here? Uh, how do we want to do that uh, and why do we do that? Um, so to give uh, a little bit more context again, let's quickly go through a matrix of what these different technologies provide you with. Um, so confidential computing, in terms of overhead, we have seen that in our joint work with Intel, for example, can, the overheads can be brought down to basically ne negligible amounts. Uh, depends on the use case, how many I.O. is involved and so on, but uh, in general you can say the overheads are very small. For secure multi-party computation, the com compute overhead is, I would say, signific significant. So as I said, orders of magnitude. I think the best that you can get is one order of magnitude, depends on the use case, of course, but that's kind of the lower bound. Um, but the communication overhead, that is massive, right? You will see that in, a, in one of the follow-up slides. Homomorphic encryption, it's the other way around, right? The, the computing overhead is very massive uh, and the communication overhead is significant. Communication overhead comes from the fact that you have to encrypt your local inputs with very long public keys and, and this creates huge uh, input, input data. Uh, trusted compute base, um, so by the way, I'm generalizing, right? So you, there might be arguments for each of these entries in this table, uh, but uh, we can do that maybe afterwards. Um, trusted compute base, um, so depends on which kind of T you use for a confidential computing. It can be uh, significant to large, depending on what you use. For these other techniques, it's uh, rather small because uh, Assuming open source, you can have a look into everything, so you don't have to trust it necessarily. And it's software only, of course. Um, so you can, if you have open source, uh, you can look into everything, which is not the case for confidential computing techniques, typically at least. Uh, Security-wise, um, yeah, I insist a little bit on making this di distinction uh, for confidential computing. It's protected in use, while for these cryptographic uh, methods, it's encrypted in use. Right? That's a that's a difference. Uh, security assumptions, um, so for confidential computing, it's the co correctness of the hardware implementation plus the software SDK as well, of course, but for secure multi-party computation, it's non-collusion. If all of these three parties that you saw on, the, on one of the late um, recent slides uh, work together, then of course the, the secrets can be reconstructed easily. So if, if that assumption cannot be uh, made reasonably, then it makes no sense. And for homomorphic encryption, it's the secrecy of the keys, right? Um, scope uh, for the um, uh, cryptographic methods, you typically can protect only the data. There are schemes that also protect the code or the algorithms that are used, but these are so inefficient that you typically <laughs> can't use them. Uh, for Confidential computing, it's both. And that's, that's of course, a nice uh, um, attribute because often we encounter use cases where also the IP that is in the, in the algorithms is very uh, valuable. 
Uh, ease of use, we discussed it before already. So for if you use VM-based T's today, it's more or less lift and shift. You, you can, with very low effort, take your existing workloads and uh, put them into the confidential computing domain. Uh, for the uh, computing and encrypted data technologies, that's not the case. Uh, there has been a lot of progress in the, in the field of uh, compilers for homomorphic encryption in particular, but typically you have to re-implement uh, your algorithms on, on, these, on these architectures. Uh, so sweet spot, I would say, for confidential computing, it's whenever high performance is required, uh, machine uh, learning use cases, for example, or simulations, then there is, at the moment, no real alternative to that. Uh, for the others, uh, for secure multi-party computation, my, let's say, litmus test would be, are there, uh, is there more than one party involved that has its own data set that has to be processed somehow? And for homomorphic encryption, it's offloading, right? So there are multi-party schemes for homomorphic encryption as well, but again, very inefficient, so you wouldn't typically use them today. So. Now, uh, how does the pet space develop from my point of view? So what we see and still see to some extent is kind of this coexistence, right? Some people deploy confidential computing for a workload, others MPC, others homomorphic encryption, but they are not really built on top of each other or integrate with each other. I think this is changing now. Paul mentioned a couple of uh, examples for that, that some MPC companies are now integrating uh, MPC with confidential computing and that I would tell, uh, call that stacking. So you take the one solution, put the other one on top of it or inside of it and uh, they then uh, benefit from the, from the properties of the, typically the direction is right, MPC on top and then confidential computing as the infrastructure. Um, and then in the a little bit more fu uh, far future, I think there will be, I call that amalgamation. So things will grow together more closely, will be deep, more deeply integrated um, to leverage the benefits of, of, of each technology. And I will show you an example for that uh, in a second. So the one is in production today, cutting edge, uh, stacking, I think people are trying to establish that now, make first POCs for that, uh, and, and um, this amalgamation thing requires research and is a little bit more in the future from my point of view. So first example is uh, stacking, and we work together with, with Edgeless here uh, to use their Constellation platform, which is, as you probably know, a Kubernetes uh, distribution that deploys the workers in uh, in confidential VMs, uh, and that has a very nice feature that you don't have to change a lot when you when you do that and get a fully protected uh, Kubernetes cluster. And what we did together is we uh, deployed uh, Carbine Stack, which you will hear a little bit more in a, in, on a, one of the next slides, inside the um, the Constellation cluster. Uh, and the, the really cool thing has been that we had to change nothing, right? It just worked out of the box. It's a complex system, Carbine Stack, so that uh, it includes Knative, Istio, and a lot, a lot of other um, uh, cloud native components, and this worked seamlessly without any changes required. So that's uh, kudos to uh, Edge Systems, uh, really uh, great technology. You will be able to read more about that on our <coughs> blog very soon. It's not, unfortunately not ready yet, but uh, will be published in a couple of days. So, uh, can we do it even better? I mean, that's kind of straightforward, right? It worked uh, out of the box, more or less. Everybody can do it today. But is there even more potential in it? And uh, to understand that, I quickly explain how the services within Carbine Stack work. So we have four of them at the, at the moment. Uh, we have uh, a storage subsystem and a computation subsystem. The storage subsystem uh, consists of M4. This is where the secret, secret shares live. Uh, that I've explained on the on the MPC slides. Um, we have uh, Castor, that is the service that stores this correlated randomness for letter consumption. We have Klishko, that's the service that generates the correlated randomness and stores it in Castor. And we have Ephemeral, which uses Knative to allow for uh, a function as a service for MPC. And now what's the problem here? So that's one instance of Carbon Stack running, right? And typically we have at least two. So uh, there is another virtual cloud provider that hosts exactly the same service and these have to communicate. We have learned uh, that for multiplications they have to communicate and also for generating the, the, the offline material they have to communicate. And now look at the numbers. So for the online phase uh, for uh, 100k ops per second, 
they have to communicate. So these are ballpark numbers, right? Or rounded to the order of magnitude. Uh, so 10 megabytes per second communication all the time while they do the computation. Uh, for the offline phase, it's much worse. So for this 100 uh, K ops per second, you need one gigabyte per second communication between these two parties. And that's of course a lot. If you do the, uh, the, the, the math here, uh, taking uh, Azure egress bandwidth pricing, you get a 100 US dollar per hour, just for the communication stuff, right? I read that as per hour squared, which again, I know. Oh, sorry, no, no, that <laughs> no, that's, yeah, yeah, that's just the, uh, the, the f yeah, so. What is the, the takeaway here? So MPC is a chatterbox, right? and if you deploy it on a public cloud, you pay insanely high amounts of money for it. So what we, can we do about it? Yeah, it's, I think it's more or less straightforward, right? So we took one of the, so MP speeds, that's the, on the right side, uh, below this factory symbol, that's the state-of-the-art MPC framework. And what they have, they have a, a so-called fake offline phase, or you can also call it a trusted dealer or a, a deterministic uh, offline phase, which does, uh, doesn't use a cryptographic method for generating this offline material, but just creates locally, right? We've just uh, coming up with two random numbers and then calculate the product out of, out of it, do the uh, secret sharing, and then you have the, the correlated randomness for uh, for multiplications. And of course that's completely insecure, so in, in that way it doesn't work, but what we did is we uh, put this factory uh, inside uh, a Grameen um, um, library OS uh, using SGX for uh, ensuring the confidential computing properties. So what does that help? Uh, so f first of all, it's deterministic. The reason why that is the case, so these are the two parties, right? Left the, from the last slide that we saw. So the left side creates uh, correlated randomness and the right side creates correlated randomness. But of course, if these do not match, then it will not work because the correlation will not hold anymore. And that's the reason why they exchange uh, a seed at the beginning. Uh, the seed is used to in initialize the pseudorandom uh, uh, number generator and uh, leads to the fact that both create the same correlated randomness and on both sides you, you use only the, the local shares to, uh, to work with it. So that's again the, let's say the sequence diagram for what happens. So um, the, the parties request for correlated randomness, then the, the generators, they do remote TLS uh, remote attested TLS with mutual attestation to be sure that uh, the thing that runs there is actually a, uh, a secure platform and also uh, we run the, the factory um, used to generate the correlated randomness uh, and as soon as they are have ensured that this is the case, they start exchanging secret parameters to initialize this factory, and then if this is done, they can start creating the correlated randomness and deliver it locally to the customer service for storing it. So what is the benefits of this? Um, so first of all, it's uh, multiple orders of magnitude faster than the cryptographic method, right? That's uh, because you just, it's just coming up with uh, um, uh, these this triples uh, locally. So that's super fast. You don't have any cryptography in there. Uh, but even better is there is n nearly no communication cost involved, right? So the only thing that goes over the LAN boundary is basically the seed and this, this Mackey share that, uh, that, that are exchanged. So you have virtually no cost. Of course, the trade-off, there is no free lunch, so uh, you have to trust that the T implementation uh, is, is secure, right? But you don't have cryptographic uh, guarantees anymore. So that's the first step. Uh, can we go even better? And that is now next step, so it has not been implemented so far. But this is what I meant when I, when I gave the subtitle to my talk, uh, capture the middle ground between security and performance. So, uh, so by the way, this doesn't mean that at the crossing of these two lines there is zero, right? I wouldn't put CC protected workload uh, very in the low security space. That's just, there is a lot of space below here that is not shown on the slide. Um, so we would have uh, the cryptographic offline phase. Um, it's very secure, but super slow, right? That means it's here on the x-axis, very to the very left, and on the on the y-axis for security, very high. On the other side, we have CC protected, which is super performant. Uh, but yeah, from a p uh, security perspective, it's not as, or at least you cannot prove its security. Let's say it this way. 
And then we have uh, number three, that is our, the, the implementation that I just described. Now the question is, can we do better? Uh, so the, the first attempt would be to get rid of the second uh, T instance here and just have one, right? You can still do remote attestation for both sites and it basically would result in the same, in the same uh, uh, um, correlated randomness being generated. But the difference is that now you can see again the LAM boundary, so this dashed blue line, you can see that a lot of, so the, the correlated randomness itself is large, right? So you have to again transfer all that data over the LAN boundary, creating again egress uh, bandwidth cost on Azure. So I would think this is not better than the other. Um, can we do better still? Huh? So, and that's, that's the next idea that we had. So uh, when I described the MPC protocols, we talked about a very specific security model, which is called active secure malicious uh, majority. That means, um, N minus one parties, MPC parties, could be corrupt and the security is still there. And the second one is active security. The players can arbitrarily um, um, uh, divert from the, from the protocol and do whatever they want. The security is still not uh, compromised. Uh, there is a, another class uh, which is called honest majority active security. And there uh, you have to ensure, as the name implies, that you have an honest majority within the MPC setting. Um, so in that case, with three parties, you have to uh, be sure that no more than, than one of these uh, boxes is broken, right? Um, and now the idea is, okay, um, the, the, or the good thing is that these protocols have very low communica communication costs compared to the malicious security, active security protocol. And now, um, by doing this, we can, we can do the following. We can use MPC within that dashed rounded box uh, to set up another MPC cluster uh, and have a generator run in each of the T-protected boxes and you use different uh, T implementations for that, right? So that means to break that system. So we, have, we still have the, the same benefits as before, right? And, uh, only uh, the, the, the thick lines are the high bandwidth uh, connections. So these do not cross the, the boundary, uh, the LAN boundary. But on the other hand, since you have now three independent uh, uh, T implementations and using this MPC protocol that I described, you can be sure that an attacker have to break two of these T's simultaneously and it's still all fine, right? Okay, next level of sophistication would be kind of doing the same thing as we did for the, for the non-MPC setting. So you would replicate that setting on both sides and just exchange the seed again, and then they locally compute uh, all, all the triples uh, or the correlated randomness as before. Whether this is really better or not has to be proven. So we have not implemented it, not tested it. I would doubt that it's better. I would say the number five is, is still the better one, but that has to be seen. So that would be, for, from my point of view, an example for amalgamation. So we use the properties of one technology uh, to improve the technology uh, or the, the missing parts uh, from the other technology. So um, again, back to Carbine Stack. What do we try to achieve with Carbine Stack? We want to democ democratize MPC. Uh, we live in a world currently where MPC is largely proprietary. We have uh, startups out there that build their own solution. If you, if you manage with your partners to uh, uh, agree on a, on, a, on a technology provider, you still have a, a vendor lock-in uh, because these things are not interoperable at the moment. Uh, it can be opaque, so of course I think you can agree with these uh, startups to uh, uh, open up their source code so that you can have a look, but um, it's not open source in the first place. And um, that means it also needs to be trusted. And what we want to achieve with Carbine Stack is to change it, right? Having an open MPC uh, a framework where everybody can look into, where everybody can integrate with their uh, specific MPC engines, for example, um, which then would create network effects because of this ecosystem, right? Uh, Every player that comes adds to the, to the value of the network, uh, which again stimulates people to join the network. Um, it's uh, future-proof because you have then a lot of momentum in that community to bring forward the technology. Uh, you have more rapid innovation uh, because you can more easily work together also across company boundaries. Uh, yeah, it's transparent and everybody can look at the source code. And now we will add this 
uh, implementation to the to Carbine stack so that when you deploy to the cloud, you have significantly lower cost with still uh, reasonable uh, security guarantees. And you can choose, right? If you want super high security, you can still use the classical cryptographic um, uh, protocols for that. Okay, so that's my last slide. Um, so if you like Carbine stack, show us your love. So uh, give us a star on, on GitHub. Uh, if you see benefit in, in uh, secure multi-party computation in general, you can also consider joining the initiative. Um, and we have, end of November, we have uh, the Carbine Stack Conference a second time. So that will be hosted in, at our headquarters, research headquarters in Germany. Last time we had um, s over 60 people from over 30 companies that have been interested in that and we will discuss a lot of technical improvements that we did throughout the last year uh, to make people show what the, or to show to people what the combination of MPC and cloud native actually brings to the world, right? So that's the idea. So with that said, that is my talk. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you very much indeed. We do have some time for questions. Um, I've got about a million, um, so I'll, I'll start with one, if I may, and you can think up more questions, and let's go with that. So my first one was, what's the state of the art um, for, for this sort of stuff and quantum resistance? Where are we with that? Is there good stuff happening, or are we not quite sure where we, where we are? We are not quite sure of it, that's true. So, there are f so the online phase typically is information theoretically secure, so there is no problem. Um, for the offline phase, it depends on which concrete crypto 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 um, mechanisms you use. But there are, for example, lattice-based systems that are believed to be quantum resistant, and then it, uh, that would work out. But time has, sh has to show whether this is true or not. Huh? Thank you. Any questions in the audience? Summer. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it was specifically interesting, the slide in which you showed the confidential computing compared to other um, technologies, homomorphic encryption and uh, multi-party computation. It was very interesting. I have one question about that slide. So in that, you mentioned that the TCB for process-based is significant. And for VM-based, it's large. I would have expected the other way around. And I would like some clarification on that. Uh, because the VM, you, you are trusting the whole VM, right? And in process-based, you are trusting that process specifically. And I would have expected ah, okay. it the other way around. So, so I just want to be I, sure. I think we have just different interpretations of the words. So significant is for me lower than large. So oh. large means it's. Yeah, maybe that's, I have to use maybe different words for that. But I think we are in agreement here. So, yeah. And I, I'm going to, I would take issue with a number of these as well for a variety of this. This is, you say this is kind of the average or one way of doing it. It is possible to have very small um, TCBs for both the, the uh, process based and VM based mm -hmm. that if you're writing your own rather than taking a, an entire sort of standard VM it, the approach that NUX has taken and some others have taken as well uh, that it is possible to have those small so that may be kind of right on the average but I think there's a, a number of these can shift in various yeah. directions yeah, exactly. and I think that's one of the areas where there's a lot of work that still needs to happen on the technical side and it's really really interesting uh, any other questions again I've got loads so uh, anyone else want to ask a question Okay, it's me then. So um, you talked about using RATLS about for attestation. I was very glad to hear the word attestation used because it's a kind of important one in this context. Um, is are you doing things in a way that the, uh, the carbine itself is attestation aware, or does that is that attestation passed out to other parties for them make to, for them to make decisions about uh, trustworthiness of what's going on? And I also are you using the attestation for the code as well as the data? You mentioned mm -hmm. that you can, of course. Yeah, I think for the for the first approach, so this what we did with Azure Systems. So here you would, as a user of the platform, do the remote attestation against the whole platform, right? So that would be one of the scenarios that you described. For the other one, it's rather between the parties. So uh, for these guys, they want to be sure before they expose so the Mackie shell, right? If that is leaked, then the whole security of the platform is gone. So that means they have to make sure before sharing that that the other party, uh, the other party is trustworthy. And for that reason, we use uh, uh, remote attestation to ensure that this is really the case. 
So in, the, in this case, between the Carbine Stack instances and in the other case, between the user of Carbine Stack and Carbine Stack itself. So both. Uh, Excellent. So for those of you who don't know me, I should probably introduce myself. I'm Mike Bussell. I'm the executive director of the Confidential Computer Consortium. I'm helping host this with Paul. Um, and um, uh, I'm really pleased that we're talking about attestation in a variety of ways. I think it's one of the things that's going to change uh, as, as maturity of the market comes in. People begin to realize that attestation is vastly important, but you just highlighted two different ways of using it, sort of within process or you know, across between parties and then externally to the more the sort of um, orchestration layer almost, if you will. And I think there's going to be lots of conversations about that. And I'd love to see you know, the companies here who are you know, represented thinking about all those things as we go. Um, any other questions? We've got time for one more question. Go for it. So you mentioned that, uh, I mean, the main purpose here is to reduce the communication uh, mm -hmm. due to the cost in the cloud. Does it also help with the performance because the offline phase needs less communication? Does it? Yes, it does help with performance. So that was the takeaway here, right? So it's multiple orders of magnitude faster in generation as well. Okay, and you said initially the best case would be one magnitude of performance decrease so that you could get almost up to, to native speed then, or? Oh no. Here we get it almost up to speed with the fake offline phase oh, okay. unprotected <laughs> performance, which is as, as good as it can get. <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, I'm going to ask one more because you've got a bit more time. Uh, what's uh, Carbine written in? Oh, it's a mix. Uh, so we have the, these computation services that I mentioned. So Ephemeral and uh, Klitschko, these are written in Go. As a, yeah, it's a cloud system, right? So you get the most people with, with that. Um, interest and uh, skills uh, and the uh, storage layer is written mostly of because of legacy uh, in Java and then the clients is all you can think of right even WebAssembly is uh, one language that we support for the client side because we don't want to implement everything and again and again for each language so we have a full methods and proofs person here and I'd love to uh, have a discussion at some point about the trust you can have in your implementation um, given a variety of those things, but we don't really have time for that. Uh, please, a round of applause, if we may, for Sven. That was really interesting. Thank you.